Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Two weeks ago, I was inspired by the videos of Bill Rutenberg, Steve Donahue, and Aaron Facer to join in what Aaron started calling Bag Tuesday. For that video, I just took you on a rummage through my everyday purse. Since then, there have been a few other entries for this tag, including by Dia at the fairly new channel Novel Ideas. I thought I might try again. In addition to my daily purse, I have two other bags I use regularly, a library bag and a knitting bag. Today, especially since I seem to be talking less and less about actual books on this fundamentally book-oriented channel, I thought I would not only show you my library bag, but talk about what books I brought home from my last big library checkout. Many are books that you all have recommended to me, either quite directly in comments or emails, or at least by talking about them on your own channels. Thank you for all the suggestions. So, for the bag, this is a classic large leather tote from the company Portland Leather Goods in the colorway Cognac. Pretty similar to the purse I showed you last time. The difference is, this is a large rather than a medium, and it doesn't have a zipper, which makes it handy for carrying more books, but a little less secure. Also, the color is lighter and redder, and the leather is smooth rather than pebbled. It's very strong and very sturdy, and it's also really beautiful. I use it to carry books to and from the library, but I also use it to store my library books, at least the ones not in immediate use, until it's time to return them. In fact, I have kind of a system. I start with all the books lined up facing one direction, the right side as you face the pocket. After I take a book out and read it, I replace that book on the left side, facing the other way. This is, of course, totally unnecessary. I'm sure I would remember which books were ready to go back and which books I still wanted to read, but I developed this system when I was keeping a library bag for the whole family, all three people in one bag, and I needed to make sure not to prematurely return books my spouse or son still wanted to keep. And now it's a habit. So I've already taken out all the books, and really that leaves almost nothing else in my library bag. In the front pocket, I keep a library card. I don't actually use this card myself. I have a tag on my keychain that I usually use at the checkout kiosk, but due to particular family issues, there are times when I can't leave the house for a library jaunt and need to ask someone else to return overdue books or pick up books I've requested to be put on my whole shelf. Having a library card always in the bag saves me the hassle of having to remove the library card from my keychain, and it really doesn't add any weight or take up any space. Most of the time, though, I'm the one taking this bag to the library. And like with my everyday bag I showed you a couple of weeks ago, this bag has a little leather strap, which may be hard to show you, that unhooks and I slip my key ring on and snap it back. Across from the key uh, hook is a pocket. And in it I put my phone, a mask, um, my ever-present chapstick, and a great little lightweight pouch my son created when he was young. He didn't have a pattern or even see a model of something similar, I don't think, but just came up with the idea. He'd outgrown a pair of jeans, or perhaps I'd outgrown a pair of jeans, and he Frankensteined them into a variety of other uses. One thing he made was a little pouch made by removing the two back pockets and the front zipper and then sewing them all together. It's pretty amazing. In here I put my ID, a credit card, and a bit of cash just in case, and my public transportation card. It's about a 45 minute walk to this particular library, the closest one with a really great selection and a great online platform, which I really came to rely on during the pandemic. 
when the weather's nice and I'm not carrying a bajillion books, I love to walk it. But otherwise, I hop on the city bus, which I pick up just a few houses down from our house instead. Okay, in addition to these, I keep a pencil and a little pad of paper. Just in case I have something to jot down. I also keep an additional bag that I use in case I have more books to carry than I expected. This one is a heavyweight cloth tote bag that my spouse gave me shortly before we started dating. And it is clearly in need of a wash. While this one's kind of special to me, I often have random cloth totes in there. They're leftovers from random conferences that David or I attended in past years. And sometimes I carry my old suede backpack as well as this bag if I want to distribute the weight over my shoulders. But I have to be careful not to strain it too much since it is on its last legs. So that leaves us with just the books. Let's go through them. First off is a new book by Michael Twitty called Kosher Soul. If you've been a Hannah's Books completist and have a better memory than I do, you might know that I really loved Twitty's book, The Cooking Gene, a journey through African-American culinary history in the Old South. The Cooking Gene is the kind of book I think is my very favorite kind of nonfiction. Fundamentally, a story about one fairly contained topic that opens up all sorts of interesting questions and ideas about much larger issues. It's about culinary history, but it's also about the history of race and racism in America, about cultural continuities between West African traditions and cooking practices in communities of enslaved people and the descendants of enslaved people, and about how food traditions highlight how much Black people and white people in the South have shared consciously or unconsciously, quote, the power that food has to bring the kin of the enslaved and their former slaveholders to the table, where they can discover the real America together. I was thrilled when reading that book to come across Twitty's appreciation of my father's academic work. Pretty exciting. But now, this book, Kosher Soul, is equally exciting and perhaps less expected. Like The Cooking Gene, Kosher Soul is a wide-ranging exploration of both cultural conflict and cultural synthesis, but also a deeply personal memoir. This time, talking about Twitty's own roots in both Black and Jewish communities, as well as his brilliant and creative discussion about how these two pasts of his background intertwine. And I'm loving it so far, and I'm eager to talk about the book in more detail when I finished it. The next book is Mending Life, a handbook for repairing clothes and hearts by Nina and Sonia Montenegro. I mentioned that in addition to being a reader, I'm a knitter. And that means my house is full of not only books, but yarn. Sometimes I joke that our house is insulated with an organic mixture of paper and wool. Sadly, a house full of yarn is too often also a house full of moths, nasty little bugs that eat wool clothing. So some of our hand knits and some of our other favorite objects have holes that need to be darned. I have a bag full of garments that I've been accumulating over a while scared to repair them because my darning skills are so slipshod and obvious. So finally I searched online and in the library for information about how to make neater repairs. And what I found and can't believe I didn't think of before is the idea of doing quote visible mending. That is mending that is not slipshod at all but very carefully done and neat but also very obvious and sometimes quite deliberately decorative. If you don't have the perfect color yarn or the ability to precisely and invisibly duplicate the stitches of the garment you're trying to fix, this is a bit easier and more accessible. It's a style of repair that's also quite charming. It's sort of pointing out that your garments have histories 
and that you're choosing to make your clothing last for longer, to stay out of the landfill and not to be immediately replaced with what is often referred to as fast fashion, cheaply made clothing that isn't designed to last, completely unsustainable and contributing to both environmental destruction in a variety of ways and unjust treatment of workers who make the clothing. Well, I haven't read Minting Life yet, but I've glanced through it at the illustrations, and I can't wait to dive into both the book and the mending. Okay, I have finished the next one. It's Dinner with Edward, the story of an unexpected friendship by Isabel Vincent. It's a very different kind of book, a sweet memoir about a young woman who befriends a recently widowed elderly man, the father of one of the young woman's friends. The two meet weekly for dinners, lovingly prepared by Edward, and the meals are exquisitely described, as is the burgeoning friendship that teaches both to appreciate the lives that each of them have in front of them. To be clear, these aren't romantic dates, but these are two people who share a kind of wisdom with each other about the nature of beauty, the pain of loss, various kinds of loss, and the power of familial love. It's a short and sweet read, nothing terribly deep, but lovely and ready to return to the library book drop. The next book has some similarities in topic, but seems radically different. Our Souls at Night by Kent Harif. Very early on, after I joined BookTube, I put this author on my to-be-read list, although not this book specifically. I still really want to read Harif's trilogy. Trilogy? I think it's a trilogy. Starting with Plain Song. If I'm remembering correctly, Kelly at Books I'm Not Reading has talked about these books in a way that makes me sure I would like them. This one, though, is a slim novel about two elderly people who grapple with both loneliness and connection and about their compassion towards each other at the end of their long lives. Well, the next one came very highly recommended by one of you in the comments. The Pigeon by Patrick Suskind is a tiny novella about one day in the life of a normal man living in Paris. I've made a point to avoid learning a whole lot about this one, but I do know that it's supposed to be both a little macabre and really funny, sort of maybe Kafka-esque. I'm just hoping I'll read it before the library issues a recall. The book seems to be in great demand there. Well, in December, when I did my, quote, cozy reading experiment, I received a couple of suggestions in the comments for books that might fit in in one way or another. Not necessarily obviously cozy, but about making one's way through cold times. Both were a bit hard to get a hold of. One was Wintering by Catherine May, and it had a long waiting list. And the other was Winter by Rick Bass. And that one required the services of a talented interlibrary loan librarian. Now they've both arrived just in time for the daffodils and other blooms filling our yard and neighborhood. So, it's time to go on to another season. Why not even skip spring and pick up Charles McGrath's newish memoir, The Summer Friend. McGrath is a former editor of the New York Times Book Review, and this book is recounting a friendship with another man with whom he spent many hours sailing and golfing and playing cards each summer. It's a long friendship over many decades in the vein of what many men of his generation had. People who spent a lot of joyous time together, but never really expressed anything emotional. The book's an account of their friendship, but also the ways McGrath looks back on their friendship with each other after the other man's death. From what I've heard, it's a fairly plain or modest book, and that seems appropriate for the story. I'm pretty intrigued by this one, 
but its alternative seasonality has made me put it off for the past few weeks. Still, I hope to read it soon. Phosphorescence by Julia Baird is also on my list. I really go back and forth about whether this is exactly the right book for me or exactly the wrong book for me. After a couple of attempts to say something about the book, I fear I might hate this book, and I finally decided to just start by reading you a publicity summary. After surviving a difficult heartbreak and battle with cancer, acclaimed author and columnist Julia Baird began thinking deeply about how we as people persevere through the most challenging circumstances. She started to wonder when we are overwhelmed by illness or loss or pain or a tragedy outside of our control, how can we keep putting one foot in front of the other? Baird went in search of the magic that fuels the light within our own phosphorescence. In this stunning book, she reflects on the things that lit her way through the darkness, especially the surprising strength found in connecting with nature and not just experiencing awe and wonder about the world around her, but deliberately hunting it daily. The idea of a book about persevering through challenging times seems just right for me. But the idea of our own phosphorescence well, I don't think that kind of language is going to do anything for me except light my hair on fire. I think I first heard about this book from the brilliant Olive at the channel A Book Olive. Is that right? And so I'm assuming, or at least hoping, that Baird doesn't overdo the woo-woo metaphors. Okay, there are three more books from my library bag, all widely talked about on BookTube, which I think I won't discuss in any depth today since I haven't even poked through them yet. One is Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, Leonard and the Hungry Paw, and Zori by Laird Hunt. I have a few other books that I think are kind of similar to these, all on hold at the library right now, or on my shelves. So perhaps I'll make a video about the whole set at some point. I'd love to hear if you've read one of these three, or one of the others I've listed today. Do let me know what you think. Well, that is it for today for this library bag tour. Thanks for joining me here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.